Hey everybody, this is Patrick JMT and I'm partnering with Chegg, and here we're going to look at an introduction to line integrals. So I'll try to give a geometric intuition about what line integrals are actually computing, and then we'll compute values of three different line integrals. There's certainly a lot more to talk about with line integrals. You can talk about them in space, and a lot of these formulas will just generalize. You can also do things with vector fields, and uh, so there's certainly more to do, more to discuss, but I think this is a good place to start. Okay, so let's start back for a second, though. So at this point, I'm sure you've seen uh, calculating double integrals over region D, where D is, a, you know, uh, some, some region in the xy plane. And if our, if our surface, f of xy, is greater than or equal to zero, specifically if it's uh, greater than zero, what we're doing is if you project the, that surface down into the, to the xy plane, well, look at this region D. You can kind of imagine like it's, it's its shadow. And we can, when we compute this double integral, we're finding the volume of that solid. Okay, so that's when we're doing double integrals. What we're doing now is, you can think about you've got this, this space curve, f of xy, in 3D. And again, in my picture, let's assume that it's uh, strictly positive. And again, if you project that, that curve into the xy plane, we get some curve c. What we're doing when we're computing this line integral is what we're doing is you can imagine, you know, like dropping a curtain down from this function f of xy just so that it sits right on top of your curve. And what you're doing is you're finding the area of like one side of that curtain. So again, that's if, if your function is positive. It can certainly go, you know, beneath the xy plane. You, you can get negative values as well. But at least geometrically, if your function's positive, you can think about it in those terms. Okay, so the formula without proof um, is the following. So it says if we're integrating over this curve C of our function f of xy with respect to uh, s, and you can think about this as being arc length, what we'll do is we have to find a parametization for our curve. And once we have that, if we know that t is between a and b, we just replace our x with whatever its parametization is, the same thing for y, and then we have to multiply by this expression. And you may remember that this stuff underneath the square root uh, comes from arc length. So perhaps it's not surprising since we're integrating over this curve. And again, all you're doing is you're just kind of chopping up this curve into a bunch of different points. You can take a point uh, inside of each interval of the curve. We could compute the value of our function at, at that point, and you would multiply it by the, uh, the width of that little segment of curve, and that would give you an estimate to, to that area, that little section of the curtain. So that's kind of the geometric intuition, and that's where this formula is coming from. Again, if you're interested, you can find it in any textbook. So let's evaluate the line integral x times y to the fourth ds, where c is the right half of the circle x squared plus y squared equals 16. And again, uh, I specified here that this is from the point. So this is going to be the right half of the circle. So this is from negative 4 up to positive 4. So we're integrating over the circle. That's our curve C. So the first thing we need to do is come up with a parametization. So in this case, I think we could write x is going to be equal to 4 times cosine of t, right? If it has to do with a circle, you're using cosine and sine in some, some fashion. y in this case will be uh, 4 times sine of t. And let's see. So it looks like in this case, it looks like t would have to vary from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So let's see here. I'm just double checking one thing. So let's see, what's cosine and negative? That's a zero sine of a... Okay, yeah, making sure that this all agrees. Okay, so it looks like we're traveling this way along our circle. Okay, so the parametization looks correct. I'm just double checking that. So now it's just a matter of filling in our formula. So we'll integrate from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. We're just gonna replace x with its parametization, four times cosine t. We'll do the same thing with y. That'll be 4 times sine of t raised to the fourth. We've got to take the derivative of x, which is going to be negative 4 cosine of t. Whoops, negative 4 sine of t, excuse me. Quantity squared plus, we'll take the derivative of y, which is going to be 4 times cosine of t. 
Again, we have to square it and we'll integrate with respect to t. All right, so now it's just a matter of simplification. So we've got a four here, we've got a four to the fourth here, so that's gonna give us a four to the fifth. So we've got four to the fifth, we've got cosine of t multiplied by sine raised to the power of four of t, and we can simplify underneath our radical. Notice we would get a four, a four squared and a four squared, which is 16. We would be left with sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t dt, but we know by our trig identities this is just equal to 1, so we're really just left with the square root of 16 underneath, which is 4. So that means I've pick up, picked up yet another 4, so my 4 to the 5th will become now 4 to the 6th, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And I'm going to reorder this. This is sine to the 4th t times cosine of t dt. I'm going to let uh, to integrate this, we'll just do a u substitution. Let u equal sine of t. du is going to be cosine of t dt. And, okay, so now we're just doing a u substitution. So our limits of integration would change. I'm not going to find them. This will be u to the fourth du. If we integrate that, we would get u to the fifth over 5. But again, we know that u is equal to sine. So we would have sine of t raised to the fifth over 5. This is being evaluated at negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So this is 4 to the 6th over 5. We would have sine of pi over 2 raised to the 5th minus sine of negative pi over 2 raised to the 5th. <clears throat> sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1. Sine of negative pi over 2 is equal to negative 1. So to me, it looks like we're going to get 1 minus negative 1 inside of our uh, brackets. 1 minus negative 1 is 1 plus 1, or 2. So this is going to be 2 times 4 to the 6th over 5 would be our solution. Okay, so a couple other useful things. So notice in this one, too, we were integrating um, with respect to arc length. Sometimes you'll, be, you'll, you'll get questions where you're integrating with respect to x or with respect to y. And what we'll do in that case is we'll use these corresponding formulas. Okay, and it feels like you're almost not even using them. You're really just going to typically, when you see one of these, you're going to let, um, you're, you're typically going to do a parametrization. You're either going to let x or y be your parameter. Okay, so here we want to evaluate this line curve. Uh, and the integral x times e to the y dx, and c is going to be the arc of the curve x equals e to the y from the point 1 comma 0 to e comma 1. So I've got my little, my little curve here sketched. So again, I'm trying to come up with a parametrization for this. Since our curve is a function of y, if whatever it's a function of, that's typically what you're going to let your parameter be. So I'm going to let y be our parameter. So we'll let y be our parameter. So in this case, we can describe the curve just simply by saying x equals e to the y. Well, y is just going to equal y. We're not going to do anything with that part. So when I go to set this up, it says x is going to equal e to the y. We've already got our original e to the y in there. So there's my x being replaced with e to the y, leaving e to the y alone. We would have to compute our dx. Well, that comes from our uh, parametrization. So my dx would, again, be e to the y, now dy. So I'm going to pick up yet another e to the y, dy. And, well, in this case, y would have to range from 0 to 1. So those are going to be my limits of integration. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the 3y, dy. And if we integrate that, we'll just get e to the 3y over 3, evaluated from 0 to 1. That's going to be e to the third over 3 minus, when we plug in 0, e to the 0 is just 1. So e to the third minus, uh, e to the third over 3 minus 1 third would be our solution in this case. Let's look at one more uh, fundamental example, I think. So when you encounter straight line segments, a lot of times it'll be useful to just come up with a, a, a vector representation for that line and then... Um, so erase this. We'll come up with a vector equation for that line, and then we'll use that as our parametrization. 
Okay, so suppose I want to evaluate the line integral xy dx plus the quantity x minus y dy, and c is going to be the line segment from this point 2 comma 0 to 3 comma 2. So in this case, I need to come up with a vector representation. So r sub 0, that's going to point at the starting point, so that would have a vector representation of 2 and 0, and our r sub 1 would have the components 3 and 2. So if I come up with a vector for that, it says that's going to be 1 minus t multiplied by, whoops, 1 minus t multiplied by 2, 0, plus t multiplied by 3, 2. Okay, so that's going to give me components, what is this, 2 minus 2t. Two so I'm distributing the 1 minus t to the, the components. My second component would be 0. Looks like we would have 3t and 2t here. And if we add respective components, <clears throat> 2 minus 2t plus 3t is going to leave me with 2 plus t, and 0 plus 2t is going to leave me with 2t. So that now tells me my parametrization. It says that x of t is going to be 2 plus t, and it says that y is going to be equal to 2t. Okay, so let's see here. And again, this is going to be t's between 0 and 1. So now we just need to go back and fill in our, um, our integral using these values. So we're integrating from 0 to 1. It says x is equal to 2 plus t. y we said is equal to 2t. dx, we need to compute that. So if I compute dx from this, notice dx is just going to be 1 dt. So we've just got dt here. Plus the quantity x, which is 2 plus t, minus y, which is 2t. And then we have to multiply that by dy. Well, in this case, since y equals 2t, our dy would be 2dt. So we've got 2dt here. And now this is what we need to just clean up and, and simplify. So let me see here. Um, OK, making sure everything looks good here, making sure I didn't do any little arithmetic mistakes. Okay, I think I think it looks okay. <clears throat> All right, so if we distribute 2t times 2, what's that going to be? 4t. And then if I do 2t times 2, uh, 2t times t, that's going to be plus 2t squared. Let's see, on the inside, 2t, uh, 2 plus t minus 2t. Man, I cannot talk today. That's going to be 2 minus t. So if I distribute the 2 to that, I'll get plus 4, minus 2t. Again, all this is with respect to t. So we can clean this up a little bit more. So it looks like we've got 2t squared. It looks like we have a positive 4t minus 2t, which is going to be a positive 2t, and then plus 4. Again, integrating with respect to t. So the integration here is not bad. We'll get 2t to the third over 3. We would get 2t squared over 2, which will just leave us with t squared plus t squared, plus 4t being evaluated from 0 to 1. So this is going to be 2 thirds plus 1 plus 4. And OK, let's just simplify it. Notice our lower limit, right? If we plug in 0, we're just going to get a bunch of zeros. So 2 thirds plus 3 thirds plus 12 thirds. What does that give us? Uh, 17 thirds is my value of this line integral. Okay, and one thing I would like to point out, so by all means in this one, um, so we just have a straight line segment. You wouldn't have to do this vector representation. We could actually just come up with an equation for the line using, you know, point-slope formula, and then we could have used a similar technique that we did in our second example. The exact same thing would have worked. This is very useful, though, uh, being able to do this, because especially if you're doing these in, in three dimensions, um, you'll need to use a vector representation. So that's why I think it's worth talking about. It's definitely something that you'll use. So again, there's much more to talk about with these. Um, you know, you can talk about these line integrals and vector fields. They definitely have uh, applications. You'll see when you get to like Green's theorem, for example, you're using line integrals. Um, and they, they obviously have some interesting uses. So, okay. Um, 
I think, I think, you know, if there's a common mistake or there's a problem, it would just simply be coming up with a parametrization. I think that's typically where most people would get stuck, you know, so make sure that you know how to come up with these parametrizations for some, you know, common types of curves, because if you get stuck there, I mean, you can't really do anything at all in these problems. So that's where you, that's where you need to uh, at least get going. And then after that, it's just typically, you know, a matter of substitution, plugging things in and, you know, be careful when you compute your the square root part. Don't forget about all that if you're integrating with respect to t. Hopefully your integral that you have to compute isn't too bad. Like, you know, this one wasn't too terrible, just a basic u substitution. But who knows, you may get something a little more, a little more hairy. Um, again, if you have curves that are expressed in a, a function of y, that's probably going to be your parameter. If your curve is easy to express as a function of x, let x be your parameter in that case. So, okay, some fundamental examples. I hope they help, and yeah, best of luck on these.